okay, great. Um, so for those of you who do not know me, my name is Jess, and this summer I externed at Providence Animal Rescue League, right in the heart of Providence. Um, so when I was searching for an externship, I was particularly looking for something, something in sheltering. Um, as many of you know, a lot of my background is in sheltering, and especially in Atlanta, where um, unfortunately pet overpopulation and in the shelters is still very much a thing. Um, so when I was up here searching for an externship, this is something I definitely wanted to jump back into. Um, I did more of adoption, so I'm more well versed in like dogs and cats, but another thing I was looking for is community outreach. I've never really worked with people and see how like I could help them. So that's another aspect that I wanted to look for, um, which also led me to Parl. So a little bit about Parl, it's in the heart of Providence. They have dogs, cats, small animals, um, and in particular ferrets from time to time, rabbits, guinea pigs. Um, there has been a few chinchillas here and there. And the services that they have, primarily adoptions, pet surrenders, they do have spay and neuter, like low cost spay and neuters. And they also hold vaccine clinics. And what I will focus more on is the pet food pantry. Um, like a lot of rescues, like they do have their mission as stated here, but one thing that I do love about Parl is that they also had a vision on their website, which is we envisioned a community in which animals and their human families have the support and resources they need to thrive together. And I thought this was really important since the MAP program focuses on that human animal interaction. Um, I did get this an externship at Parl through Tish. Um, so I was a Tish fellow this summer. And the main objectives for Tish was civic identity, civic leadership, and civic agency, and fo primarily focusing on how can I help our community and help such a diverse community as well. So projects and tasks for me, um, I was able to talk myself also into doing dog behavior um, with Shauna being my mentor. That was kind of just a natural leap. But my first and foremost project was community engagement. So I basically ran the pet food pantry this entire summer. Um, it was a lot of organizing, restocking, trying to find out where are we going to, where is this food going to come from? Um, Parl's Pet Food Pantry is donation based. So sometimes we'll have a lot of food, sometimes we won't. And that was my job in trying to figure out where is this all coming from? Um, we did have some places do drives like the Un Antia Technologies um, company and as you can see, some of these photos are very disorganized, so sometimes it would take me entire mornings just to organize every donation that came in, just making sure that it's in the right place. And when I was running the pantry, it was a lot of talking to people, listening to their stories, what do they need? Um, and while I was talking to people at the pet food pantry, it was really important for me to get names and on this map, it was especially zip codes. This was important because at some point I did have to do a lot of data entry as well. And in turn, Parl does have a van. They officially got the van while I was there for like the last two weeks. Um, the last thing that they need to do is add the pictures. And with the data that I collected and entered, on this map, we were trying to figure out what areas of Rhode Island in general are these people coming from? How far are these people coming to come to our food pantry? Um, as you can see, a lot of it is in Providence, but the goal is that with this van, they'll hopefully be able to do pop-up pet food pantries so some people don't have to travel as far. Um, this is a screenshot, but there are actually also people from Mass who came. Um, I think the farthest was Lowell. So even though it's Providence Animal Rescue League, they were very much, if you're coming to us for help, we will help you. It doesn't really matter how far you've traveled. So the second part was dog behavior. So one thing that 
I did a lot of. I was paired with the dog coordinator scout, and my first thought was like, oh, what am I going to be able to learn from scout? Because she does a lot of engagement with the dogs that are have a little more special behaviors compared to others. Um, but she would get pulled away a lot, so I kind of took it upon myself to try and train basics. Because um, I know a lot of people, when they come to adopt, they already kind of expect their new friend to be able to sit, lay down, give paw. But this, in turn, was a lot of the animal staff taking their time to know these dogs, training them the basics. Because when someone meets a dog, and they can sit once you ask them, that increases their pet adoption potential. Um, so I primarily went on walks. Moose was my favorite because he was a very hard puller and it would take us 30 minutes to go one entire block. Um, it, yeah, no, it was fun, not for my arm. So Moose, for example, like we did a lot of every time he's pulling, we stop, we turn directions. I have him sit for me, especially because a lot, it's a city, a lot of people would be walking past us and we didn't know a lot about his history. So making sure he focuses on me when people he doesn't know pass by, but it also turned out he did amazing with strangers. Um, Gideon, on the other hand, did not do very well with men. So it was very important for him to be able to sit and look at me and focus. So kind of just stuff like that, just having good man manners in general increases their pot uh, potential adoption. Um, another thing that we don't really think about a lot, a lot in animal shelters is training dogs to be ready for a home. So this is actually inside the pet food pantry where I would do a lot of enrichment with um, some of our dogs. So one day we did get a set of stairs, like obviously like these aren't gonna simulate real stairs that people might use, but I thought it'd be a good idea, like let's try and test these dogs to see how they're going to handle stairs. Um, Daisy, for example, she did okay. And as you can see, she knows, she knows that, that third step. She knows it's there, but she does not want to come up at all. Um, the audio wasn't playing, but it's very much, even though she walked away, I'm not forcing her to go back up those stairs. Um, later on, just continue the trail of treats up. Um, Nyla, on the other hand, is significantly bigger than Daisy but she, she managed to get on the second step. Um, later on, she ended up on the table, which was great, but I also kind of panicked because she was on the table. <laughs> um, another thing that I did was socialization. Um, so some of our dogs, they were very scared of strangers, a lot of stranger danger, like, I don't, if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Um, but obviously, like, we want these dogs to be a little more social. So Bando, I actually socialized with, my, um, with him on my first day and sat in his kennel for 45 minutes. So you can see that he's, like, kind of pushed in the back, not really wanting to look at me. But then within that 45 minutes, he's already looking at me, asking me for treats. Um, Coco Bean and Daisy May. Um, Daisy May was actually the more social of the two, but they were a bonded pair. Uh, Coco Bean, on the other hand, did not like people or strangers as much. So just having all these dogs socialize kind of gives them time to be outside, decompress from the shelter life, because we know it can be very stressful. Um, sometimes people think like bringing dogs to shelter may be a great idea, which in theory, yes it is, but having them go straight to a home compared to being brought to a shelter will help them out so much. So I kind of wanted to make sure that these dogs had that decompression period. Um, these were other few of our dogs. Um, Moose was, again, very sociable, got very relaxed to the point where he was able to roll on his back. King, um, again, very far from me, but within 20 minutes doing very like what we call like shy dog talk, just like talking in a really light voice, handing him treats, not necessarily pushing his boundaries. 
Um, he also ended up coming up to me as well. Sparrow um, is a little neurotic dog. Um, you can't really tell from that first photo, but in one of their play yards, they have benches. So he was just consistently sitting behind the bench when I was sitting there, my back to him, and that's where he seemed most comfortable. But at some point, again, socialization, giving him time to decompress from everything, he ended up coming up to me. Um, and then Lucky was a staff favorite because he did not like people at all. He resource guarded his people. So every time he was in an office, if one of us walked by, it was just that automatically barking, get away from my person. Um, he was another dog where I went, to his, went into his kennel, didn't really push his boundaries, let him come up to me, and then, as you see, he ended up sleeping in my lap, and I was very afraid to move because I did not want to disturb him. <laughs> so for my final research paper, um, one thing that I noticed at the pet food pantry is that we have a lot of people that come that don't necessarily speak English. Um, I speak a little bit of Spanish, but I feel like I sound like a five-year-old when I speak it. Um, but there was this one woman in particular who, when she realized I, start, I could understand her and speak with her a little bit, every time she came to Pet Food Pantry, she just seemed so happy to see me because for her, it was someone that could finally understand her like in her native language and not have to try to translate with someone. Um, so this kind of led to my final research paper, which was the impact, impacts of bilingual and multilingual staff on adoption success. So the issue is that learning a foreign language in the US, it is not marked as important as all, at all. Um, yes, there may be like high school requirements, college requirements, but kind of after that, some of the research I was reading, it completely drops off. Um, and especially when it comes to animals and animal welfare, let's take a surrender appointment, for example. Um, if the family can only speak Spanish and they're, ter they're surrendering a dog that they can't communicate how well or what behaviors this dog has, when you bring that dog into a shelter setting, that can potentially put the handlers at risk. And just not knowing and having that language barrier of what is like, what is this dog like? Can you tell me more about this dog? Um, I figured would have a huge impact on how, how much progression can happen in a shelter setting. Um, so I did a literature review, um, and most of the papers that I could find were language barriers in veterinary care, which is somewhat helpful, but a lot of it was very much, let me translate our documents and then hand those out, not let's teach our vets or our staff to speak a certain language and see how they can help um, the, our clients. And again, it turns out there is no research about language barriers in just sheltering in general. Um, a lot of what I found, again, was just translating documents instead of actually having staff learn a different language. So my conclusion recommendation was trying to have foreign language classes for shelter and rescue staff. Um, this can vary between places. Like I know up here, Spanish and Portuguese were the two languages that people spoke the most. Um, I tried to help the people who spoke Portuguese, but I, it was very hard. Um, but they were able to have someone who can translate for them. So my lessons from Parle, um, especially at the pet food pantry, com the community that we serve are more than willing to help us as much as we are willing to help them. Um, there was an instance where we had no donations and we were waiting for a food delivery. And right when we opened, that's when the, the delivery happened. So everybody who was waiting in line for the pet food pantry, they were more than willing to help me put everything into the pantry. Like I told them like, you do not need to help me. Like it is my job to do this, but they would not let me lift one bag. They kind of made me stand off to the side and they're like, we'll put everything in there for you. You just focus on whatever you need to do. Like you're not lifting a bag. And I'm like, thank you. Um, and again, learning to know a different language, like that has a huge impact. Even though my Spanish isn't great, I know for, um, her name is Margarita, 
for Margarita, it was a huge deal for her to have someone who could understand her. Um, Dog behavior, uh, again, training the basics is great. It increases adoptability, but also having that socialization and training for in-home, what we think would be normal, like stairs, that is gonna play a huge part in adoptability as well. Um, I know I didn't really mention this a lot or at all during this presentation, but transportation has been a new interest for me. Um, Parl, for example, was more than willing to take in a transport of, I think it was 20 cats. And it's, if you guys ever visit, it's not a huge facility. Um, it's really small. So just the fact that they were willing to take in a transport of 20 kittens and like other places, they're not open to transportation at all. That is something that I found I kind of want to work on while I'm up here. So this kind of brings me to what is next. Um, again, I love community outreach, but this new interest in transportation, I wasn't necessarily sure where to focus on. So this led me to the MSPCA. Um, I am currently an animal welfare specialist. I've been there for about two and a half weeks now. And <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> and. I think I just want to spend some time there, see where I can move within the organization and hopefully improve transportation into Massachusetts because I know it's a little bit strict here. And acknowledgements, um, I do want to thank Rachel. She was my on-site mentor and just totally took me under her wing. And even everyone at Parl, especially when I was doing dog behavior and walking, they were more than happy to answer any questions, help me out. And I do want to thank Shada most of all because she was my um, mentor for my externship, but she was also my mentor this entire year and had to deal with a lot of talks for me. Um, and yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, for shelter visitation class, we visited AR Boston. Mm -hmm. That hasn't. Um, I could imagine it being a little more expensive, just like hiring someone who speaks a different language, but not necessarily being there in person. Um, I can. That's my assumption. I actually like. I know that exists, but I haven't really looked into it. But I think there's something different about like talking to someone who actually understands what you're saying instead of like waiting for that relay of like this is what they're saying because i also wouldn't know like would that person who's trying to communicate like speak that language yeah yeah because that's a huge thing too yeah yes i was curious about your dog behavior stuff would you ever teach the dogs sorry spanish like if they're going to go to a spanish speaking home would you teach them like sentence spanish so there are a couple dogs that were surrendered who their owners were completely just Spanish speaking. So obviously like we would try to like coax them in English and we we're like, okay, let's rethink this. Once we started speaking Spanish, that's when they opened up a little more. Um, obviously like, we can't assume that like a lot of people would speak Spanish. So we right. would so kind of, like, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Oh. Hair. Uh, Yeah, um, Nyla, for example, she's the underbite dog up here. Um, she, I don't know a lot of her history, um, but it's kind of just that general note because like in the US, majority of the people will speak English. Um, that's kind of just like the default to teach everything in English. Mm-hmm. So that was something more that, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Hannah, what was your question? <laughs> so just like socializing dogs there. Um, 
So that was more just because like unpredictability and we didn't know the history of a lot of dogs. Um, that was something that Scout did more of um, just because she's like the head dog behavior person. So she was the one who facilitated it more. Um, so Scout, like we would try to dog test every dog and just not like getting them real up close, but like starting far. What is the body language when they see a dog across the street? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> Hi, Jess. Hi, Malaya. Hi, um, I was, so um, you talked about access to pet food um, using Parl, because I know that you said a lot of people traveled quite far mm -hmm. to just come to the shelter to pick up pet food. And I was wondering if, um, so I know you said that they're getting a van to hopefully transport pet food and do kind of pop-ups. Um, I was wondering if it was like an idea, um, it's something similar to my organization that they did, um, was to have donation sites um, throughout the city or um, across Rhode Island where people could donate pet food and they could also pick up pet food and everything would be under Parl's name and they would log all of that, but they wouldn't have to facilitate any of the actual donations themselves. It would be with a partner um, donation site or something like that. So I don't know if that's like in the plans, um, cause I think a lot of the data entry that I ended up doing was for the van specifically. So now that we do have the van, um, I'm not entirely sure what the plan is. Cause I know they're gonna use it for pop-up pet food pantries, um, even like mobile vaccine clinics. Um, so now that we have the van, I don't know what the plan is next. <laughs> okay, thank you. Also, all these dogs are up for adoption within like the past hour <laughs> that I checked, specifically this tiny Chihuahua Daisy. As some of you know, I've been pushing her a little bit. <laughs> yes, Helene. Uh, so the question was, do they have disaster response plans? Not that I'm aware of. I know there is like an evacuation plan for like their pets specifically if something were to happen to the building, but like in general Providence, I don't believe there are any plans. <laughs> 